Good morning. Um, it's nice to be here. These surroundings are fantastic. And uh, we work um, out of New York City, uh, but it's still very close to Long Island. Breezy Point goes right all the way out to the city uh, in Vines. So uh, that's where we do. So I'm real pleased to be here to give you a little idea of Gotham Whale and the work that we're doing um, in the waters around New York. Gotham Whale is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to study, educate about, and advocate for the whales that are returning to New York City. So we've been, um, we think we have a very cool logo. Uh, it really captures the juxtaposition of the big city and the big whales. This all began after I retired from uh, the New York Aquarium and um, started out by just doing some seal watches. I was a uh, naturalist on board the American Princess and uh, I retired in 2009 and now I've been working harder than ever um, developing Gotham Whale. But um, in 2010, our boat captains who have very good um, connections to the fishermen and everyone that's out on the water, started to hear about uh, reports of whales in the area. So in 2011, we started what was known as adventure cruises, because it was an adventure if we would see a whale or not. And you can see by the uh, numbers that we had at that time, it was uh, pretty slim pickings. We had three sightings in 2011 with a total of five whales. Uh, we call a sighting anything that we see from one location at one point in time. So you can have more than one whale at one sighting. And then since that time, the whales have been increasing uh, exponentially, more than double each year up until uh, 2016, not quite um, doubling the previous year. Now, uh, 2017 is about the same numbers as 2016, but we think that's because of the limits, not of the increase in whales, but how many times we can be out there to observe them. Uh, while we work with citizen science primarily as citizen scientists, we also feel that we're contributing to real peer-reviewed science. So we've been working with colleagues uh, from New York. Uh, we work very closely with Cressley. This is a paper that's in uh, review right now for marine uh, mammal science, and we hope to get that out shortly. Uh, one of our interns, our graduate students, produced this paper that was actually accepted and published in marine mammal science. So we're very proud of the real peer-reviewed uh, work that we're doing besides the citizen science activities. <clears throat> Most of our data collection comes from uh, the platform of the American Princess. This is a commercial operation, as I said, right out of uh, Long Island, um, Breezy Point. We leave from uh, Reese Pier, and this is where we collect most of the information that we get. I'll explain a little bit further uh, how we're extending that to more of a citizen science operation. <clears throat> but we see whales. Our boat captain likes to say, Rockaway, the new Cape Cod. And we always say to potential customers, and I invite everybody to come out and see this firsthand, um, we can see whales with the skyline of the uh, Manhattan in the background. And that's pretty true. We never go um, offshore to any great degree. We may go along the shoreline, uh, 20 miles or so along Long Island or down the New Jersey coast, but we don't go offshore. And we see whales like this, with the um, skyline in the background. We think that's pretty impressive. And we're trying to tell New Yorkers about this fact. And it's amazing how many people still don't realize that whales are there, the city is there, and it's really spectacular. 
it took this, what we call our iconic photograph, to really kind of say, wow, that must be photoshopped. Uh, any of these photos that you see is not photoshopped. And this is the kind of images that kind of captured uh, New Yorkers' attention that whales are right around uh, in our backyard. Uh, you may notice that I'm, my origins are in uh, New England, so I say backyard. <laughs> it's not easy to get these kind of photographs. Everything has to come into uh, play. Uh, the whale has to behave. The boat has to be in the right position, and it really helps if you happen to be looking in the direction of where the whale is. <laughs> but this is the kind of images that we're able to capture uh, from our uh, trips on, on the American Princess. This one in particular I, I like because it shows the way that the whale expands its throat um, pleats and, and just sucks in lots of water and it's very effective like a pelican's uh, bill to suck in the water which sucks in the fish and then they push the water out through their baleen and it's a very effective way for these whales to eat. And they're doing it um, in this area. We don't even count feeding uh, unless we see them with the fish falling out of their mouths during these, uh, what's known as lunge feeding. Because you can't really tell, you may see uh, whales in the area, they could be feeding underwater, but unless we have very direct evidence of this uh, activity of lunge feeding, we don't record that as a feeding episode. And of course, uh, breaches are always uh, pretty spectacular. This is right off of Long Beach, right near the uh, anchorage where these uh, tankers, uh, they anchor out there and wait their turn to unload in, inside the harbor itself over in Jersey. Now our work is very much based on, as I said, citizen science, a model that was started by Audubon in 1900 with their backyard Christmas bird count, where they ask people to go out and just see how many birds they see and record that. And over time, that's given a, a marvelous database, uh, and lots of things have been uh, determined just by regular people looking out with many eyes and collecting this information. And one of the models that we have been doing is following what's been done for many years up in Maine and Massachusetts, where people take photographs of the fluke, which like fingerprints are much like uh, individual identifications. So uh, we've been uh, collecting these. We currently have about 78 individual animals that we've uh, identified. The people in Maine have thousands but you have to start somewhere. And each, each fluke has, a, uh, as I say, individual coloring pattern, but they may also have some kind of uh, marking like this notch that was taken out. Now, it's still pretty primitive work. All of the photographs have to be matched by human eye. And it occurs to me that the brains of Brookhaven might put their uh, attention towards uh, applying some kind of um, facial recognition software to help us solve these kinds of problems so that we could sort through these many, many photos uh, through computer algorithms, which we think are the technology is definitely there. FBI does it all the time. Google's doing it to find your friends, etc. So from this, we're able to see a good record of what individual whales are doing. We have a record here of this particular 2000, uh, I mean, NYC 004, and its history of where we saw the <coughs> latitude and longitude and the date and the time. <clears throat> now, we've worked, we work very closely with Presley, as I said, and here's a, here's a match that we were able to make with just the dorsal fin. 
you can see how this is exactly matched. And you can see that this was seen off of um, Montauk in July, and this was seen by us uh, in June, so that shows that kind of eastward um, migration of this particular whale. It's the only way right now until people are able to put tags on them to track any kind of mo motion for individuals. And it looks like they migrate a bit. This is an Instagram uh, posted by uh, Jankit uh, Dankits in 1678. <laughs> it's really great that they, he had that technology, but it shows uh, and emphasizes what I'm saying, the whales are coming back. This sketch, this is Brooklyn. This is Staten Island. This is the Verrazano's Narrows. So these whales, the depiction of these whales is right in this area, if I can show you, just the same area that we're noting and documenting these whales. This would probably be the, the view that was depicted in that 1678 um, etch, etchograph or whatever it was. Um, so anyway, this is kind of where we see the whales. It's at the apex of all of the shipping that is coming into New York Harbor, which is even increasing. All of these post panmax sized boats are all converging right into this area to get up into the uh, unload at container ports and, and the refineries over in Jersey. So, and this is a actual, um, another depiction with all of our little dots of where we've documented whales. And you can see this is a busy place for ship traffic. They're playing in traffic. There's no question about that. This is Ambrose Channel. That was a marker of Ambrose Channel with that green buoy. And you can see how close they can come to tugboats and other ships. They sometimes, fishermen, are looking for the same um, situation that the whales are, where um, predators like striped bass or bluefish are chasing these bunker, the menhaden, into a tight ball so that the whales can feed on them. But of course, the fisherman is trying to catch the bluefish or the bass uh, as well. So they come up right near fishing boats. But one of the troubling things is that people are coming in contact with whales and actually harassing them. Now they're doing this out of macho instinct, um, jet skiing, and they're totally ignorant of the laws that are in place and the fact that they could be in trouble, they could, uh, injure the whales, they, they could be injured themselves, and it's against the law. We actually sent this photograph into NOAA to report this harassment incident that we were captured. This guy had um, his numbers clearly marked, so I think he may have gotten a call from NOAA to say, next time you're under arrest. Now, people always say, uh, why are the whales coming back? Well, New York is a great place to eat. And they have been finding these um, schools of bunker, which I said were um, aggregated into tight little balls, which the fishermen call bait balls. And then the whales can come up and do this lunge feeding in a very efficient manner to have hundreds of pounds of uh, fish in one gulp. We're working very hard with um, the Herring and Lions, uh, um, nature, um, the Nature Conservancy, Pew Charitable Trust, to keep the regulations in place that we believe have uh, really made a difference in bringing back the number of Menhaden uh, to this area. <clears throat> you can see the kind of tight schools that they 
congregate in. Now this makes great feeding for the whales, but it also makes a very efficient way for purse seiners to come in and simply encircle that and wipe out whole areas in very short order. So we're working to keep a, uh, a cap on the total allowable catch that in, will ensure these uh, menhaden coming back over time. <clears throat> we think that the um, preferred method of feeding is this lunge feeding. And I think it's because of the unique situation around New York City. Hudson River is bringing down nutrients that feed the fish. The waters are quite shallow around that area. Um, we never really go into waters more than 100 feet deep. So that gives a, a bottom that the fish cannot escape going down, and the bluefish and the bass are chasing them into these little circles of tight bait balls, and they're given a very efficient way for these whales to take in a hundred, hundreds of pounds of fish, hundreds of gallons of water, and then dispersing the water out through their baleen plates. <clears throat> this is the kind of aggregations we see. Now we've been able to take our data, and this was a map using real data, both from uh, Gotham Whale and from uh, the AIS systems of boat traffic. So it shows that some of these areas where the dark blue shows concentration of feeding activity is right smack dab in the uh, shipping lanes, shipping channels. And the channels for these big boats, the boats might as well be on railroad tracks because they can't divert their way around whales. And there's over $200 billion, $200 billion of commerce coming into New York every year. So I hesitate to say when humans and whales collide, because hopefully that hasn't happened as yet in our area, but we know for sure that it is happening. So one of the methods that we're using now to uh, take our data collection beyond just what we're able to on board the American Princess, we've developed a wanted program. And that is a program that enlists people. This is a uh, mock-up of a FBI wanted poster. I, I went down the station and took a picture, and instead of Artie Kopelman's picture in there, I, I, I put a whale in there. And then like the fingerprints, instead of fingerprints, we have the whale identifications of their flukes. Then we ask people to fill out these data sheets. And if they do, they get a reward. You know, wanted, dead or alive, here's the reward. Wanted, here's your reward, a free beer. So I'm uh, enlisting uh, bars and breweries all along the coastline to sponsor this program so that the contributors get a free beer from one of these sponsoring organizations. We, are, we do this in a two-directional two method. One is to ask for people to send in information the other is we give out information. So we've been going around to fishermen's groups, yacht clubs, um, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and telling the story. Here's the rules of engagement when you come near marine mammals. These are the rules that you should be aware of. And we would like to have your information sent in to us. This is actually one from a Coast Guard Auxiliary air pilot that, uh, that showed this whale off of, uh, off of Rockaway. So we're getting them from all different areas, and we're very proud of that. We had an excellent story of Gotham the Whale. Gotham the Whale was a whale that came into New York Harbor, inside the Verrazanos, and up into the harbor for uh, five days uh, in the November of 16. 
Now, we shamelessly, in self-promotion, named it Gotham, but uh, this whale was reported by over 20 different individuals throughout its time within the water, the waters inside uh, the Varazanos. We had, we had reports from people on the Staten Island Ferry. We had actually um, a report from the director of the Hudson River Foundation looking out his window at, in Lower Battery Park. We had a jogger from along the Battery Park area. And then we had uh, people from out their windows on the Upper West Side. So this illustrates the kind of um, eyes on the water that come from all different diverse citizen scientists. And from that, we were able to document its actual feeding within sight of the Statue of Liberty. And it traveled, oops, sorry. And then it traveled up beyond the George Washington Bridge. Now, so from that kind of information of just regular citizens looking out their window, taking a picture to documenting it, sending it into Gotham Whale that manages the data, we were able to answer a number of very interesting and important questions. Was it, was it more than one whale? No, because we identified it from the fluke and repeatedly saw the same whale over and over. So we knew it was not more than one whale. Was it sick and injured? No, because it was, oh, sorry. Uh, all right, sorry. I think this actively feeding on the bunker that were inside the uh, harbor at that time illustrates that it was in good shape. Did it get out of the harbor all right? 10 days later, we spotted it offshore on the American Princess so that we know it left the harbor in good shape and uh, was out in the feeding activities uh, about three miles south of Rockaway. So we like to think that this kind of information can be really important as whales and humans come together, which we know that they are more and more. The <coughs> recent unusual mortality event that was declared shows that lots of whales are being ship struck. And we just feel that the more information that is known, we can contribute to a better understanding and maybe have some mitigating circumstances come into play that will prevent these kinds of uh, mortalities that we're sh seeing more and more. At that time, there was 41, I, I think I know of at least three since that time, and there's probably more since I made up this slide. So I would invite you all to come out whale watching with us out of uh, Rockaway. You don't have to go to Cape Cod. You can go with Artie and his uh, Viking fleet cruises. But um, we think it's an interesting activity I'll run through, and maybe there's some questions if there's time. And um, just in our other missions, just to let you know that we do science programs and uh, on the boat, as well as in class. And yay, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> We actually have a lot of time for questions, so if you have questions, if you'll go to the aisle, Mike, because this is being recorded, and so asking the questions at the aisle, Mike, get, get your questions recorded. Uh, my name is Daniel Carpin. I have an old National Geographic that shows as a story about the whaling by the Bosques in 1570, almost wiping out the white the right whale in the North Atlantic. Have you seen any right whales in your expeditions? Uh, we saw, we not, have noted two right whales. Uh, the whales that we see are almost exclusively humpback whales. We have seen a few um, fin whales 
it happened to be late in the season, and we saw kind of incidentally a couple of minke whales. But 99.9, .9, or whatever the figure is, is all humpback whales. Hi, my name is Mike Riley. I'm with SeaTac Environmental Association. Do you have other corroboration on uh, the comeback of the whales? In other words, you're out there now looking, so you're seeing them, but uh, is there other data that's showing that there's been a trend of uh, whales coming back? Um, there is some. Uh, if you look on what is kind of the official uh, portal for where that information is collected and you will see no whales in and around the apex of the western New York bite or the entrance to New York Harbor. And that is one of the things that we're working on to get our citizen science information accepted by people like maybe like yourself who say, well, is there any um, survey work or any kind of um, systematic survey that was done? In this particular case, not in that area as yet. There is uh, peer-reviewed information that exists for areas in the Great South Channel, out, uh, out in this end of Long Island, offshore usually, but not the animals that we're seeing. Go across. Hi. Well, um, I'm from Smithtown High School, or oceanography and marine ecology students wanted me to ask, when you get identifications of, of the different whales and photographs from people who think they might know what kind of whale it is, or if they've been on the cruises, they might know the name of the whale or the number, what can you tell us about the crew of people that's going through all those photos? To help you identify it, is it just you, or do you have a small team, or do you have a whole bunch of volunteers? We have um, quite a cadre of uh, volunteers that are helping us. We're all um, volunteers. No one's salaried or, or getting any, um, except a couple of grants we've been able to receive that help support this. But it's all volunteer effort, and we'd like to do more, but capacity is somewhat uh, restrictive, but the concept is, yes, we, we have whales uh, that we know. We, we would love to tell the f people and engage them. Uh, another aspect of ci citizen science is that through participation, people become engaged. And we think that that's a, a great benefit. And give us time, we will be uh, posting little maps of uh, where we see them, uh, actually who the reporters are, etc. I'd say um, I have a, a phone app because even though you see that uh, data sheet, and we've made that data sheet available uh, pretty easily on you know, go to the website, get the data sheet, fill it in on your phone, send it to uh, paul at gothamwhale.org, and attach a photograph. We, we make sure that the person identifies themselves and submits a photograph to document that particular sighting. So we are trying to make sure that our data is standardized and reliable. So we're working on a phone app we're calling that phone app uh, Moby Click. <laughs> so, <laughs> and because it's, you're going to hear me little crybaby stuff here, but it's like pulling teeth to get people to do more than two clicks worth of effort on any kind of submissions. And so we're going to, we are in development of a uh, phone app that will Automatically, once you take your photo, it'll extract your information, the latitude, longitude, date and time, all time stamped within the uh, photograph, and then that will be sent to the database that uh, Gotham Whale is keeping. So we're, we're real hopeful that it's going to expand our uh, capacity. Well, thank you for being so responsive to all the high school students who write into you on your Twitter feed. Oh, thank you. I will pass it on to our volunteer who does exactly that. We answer questions online through Twitter.
Okay, we're going to come to this side and then to the middle. Diane Ives, Long Island Sierra Club. I have two questions. Um, can you tell if the whales, any of the whales are killed by the bends from rising to the surface too fast to get away from all the noise from the ships and the sonic, uh, the Navy's sonic testing? And that, that I saw the movie Sonic Sea at Cinema Arts Center. Yeah, it's, and, it's, and, and also, why did that whale go up the Hudson River? <laughs> okay, uh, two parts there about the uh, acoustic environment for whales. I grew up with Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau uh, wrote The Silent World. The, <laughs> the ocean is not a silent world. It's a very cacophonous place, and the, the amount of noise that is going on is amazing. Now, one thing about that is... The whales that we see do not seem to be bothered by the ship traffic because we see them right in uh, Ambrose Channel feeding right alongside the uh, boats. I, I make the analogy as probably like taking a picnic on uh, JFK <laughs> landing strip. <laughs> but let's see, what was the um, last part of your question? Oh, why did that whale go up, go up into side the harbor? Um, I believe it was uh, because the food was luring him up. Um, I happen to live on Staten Island. The morning that the first report took place, I looked out my window and I saw all kinds of bait ball activity of Menhaden being inside the inside the harbor area, and we got a shortly report thereafter. Then we, we documented it feeding in front of the Statue of Liberty and all the way up the Hudson. So I'm quite confident that it came in to feed. Now, because we identified it, we're gonna be able to detect, if we see that whale again, whether or not it is a whale that's prone to come into areas like that. And have a stern talking with it and tell it not to, not to play in traffic. <laughs> to the middle. Hi, Jean Millspore from North Shore Audubon. Yes. I was wondering, are you monitoring, and, and I guess with the, Mont, uh, the ocean center out in Montauk about all the humpbacks that are becoming in on the Long Island Sound to the harbors, we've actually seen in Seacliff and Huntington the humpbacks. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, that's another area um, that we're, we're actively involved in. I'm going to talk to the um, Coast Guard flotilla for the um, Long Island Sound area and tell them about our wanted program and try to get more information. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of collecting this information and managing it in one place that can we can make um, determinations about behavior, where they are, what time of year, et cetera. Right, thank you, and I was lucky enough to go on one of your cruises. Oh, great. <laughs> Hope to Talk see away. you again. Uh, Louise Hansen, um, do you have any idea of, of the sex of the animals or how old they are? Or uh, do you know where they breed? A, a very good question. Um, I, I make up theories like <laughs> what time of day is it? I have a new theory. Well, uh, one of the working theories that we have is that the whales that we see are younger whales. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, it's kind of difficult to get size, determinant sizes just by regular observation. But what we see is kind of uh, younger whales, not baby whales, not new juveniles, but younger whales. And my thought was that these younger whales may have found a good uh, feeding ground, mm -hmm. and instead of going up north and fighting with the old timers, they found a good place to eat around New York City. How they tell each other, I think, is an interesting question. Um, to try to be answered through some, some further work. Uh, but on the sexes, it's very difficult unless they breach or you get an underside view of those uh, whales. So no, we don't have a good 
perspective on, on sex, but size, definitely younger whales. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and where do, do you know where they, where they come from, where they're born? Um, yeah. Uh, another question we often get is, are whales intelligent and sentient beings? I, I always say, sorry, I always say yes, they know enough to go south for the winter. <laughs> and the whales go south to an uh, area um, off of Dominican Republic, the Silver Bank, and they go down there to breed and give birth. They don't eat well or in those waters, so that what they're doing is they're coming up here, gorging themselves uh, all summer long on this wonderful food like Menhaden here, seeing deals up off of uh, Massachusetts on Stellwagen Bank, and they're f getting fat and happy and going south for the winter. Um, so that's the migration pattern, and for years, my thought is that they normally would just go right past Long Island. Now they're coming and finding this excellent feeding ground for their lunch feeding. Okay, over here. Hey, my name is Peter. Um, I have a sort of question and uh, a suggestion maybe, or ask you if you know about it. And um, there's a, I'm looking at it right now, there's a citizen science-based platform for, re for gathering data in Africa. So there's automated cameras in the Serengeti. It's called Snapshot Serengeti. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Have you heard of that? And thought yes, about uh, maybe that would yes, work I for appre you? I appreciate that on the, on the app. Um, situation. I have re researched this fairly extensively, and there are things like Flukebook, there's I Explore, there's all kinds of these reporting systems. But I did a brief survey within the um, Whale Watch community, and I find that no one uses them. Hmm. They don't report it to Center for Coastal Studies. Um, they just don't, it just isn't done, I think mainly because it takes more than three clicks. So, uh, as I say, we're working and we're looking for partners to help us fund this particular project. Um, and we hope to get this really automated system with, through MobiClick where it's take a picture, everything comes out of that, and then on the back end we have the database to uh, manage this data in a more effective way than is being done now. But what I was thinking about that app is that it uses the, the public to do the identification part. Um, like if, if you were to... Oh, well, I would not, I would tales, not, um, the, 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 the scheme that we have in place, all laid out, programmer, all set, here's what needs to be done. It would come like this, from the phone to a central holding area. Then there would have to be still someone to vet that because, you know, somebody would say, I saw a whale on a beach, ha, ha, ha. Here's a picture of uh, someone in a bathing suit. Uh, we don't want that. So we would have to have some kind of quick vet and then one click into the database and then it stays there. Okay, Paul, we're out of time. Um, see me afterwards because there is a... Uh, photo identification tool out there. But it's, uh, the uh, photo identification tool has been developed down in the, the uh, forest of Central and South America for wildlife. I don't know how good it works. I, it, it supposedly works fairly well for box turtles, so. Very nice, that's what we need. All right, well again, thank you all for your interest tonight. <laughs> See you on the American Princess.